I'm here in Tallahassee, back at the site of the first permitted 3D printed building in Florida. This building was built by contractor Precision Builders, owned by James Light and Kendra Light, who we're going to be speaking with here in a minute. They subcontracted the job to Printed Farms, who has a Cobod Bode 2 printer. They completed this project by first assembling their Cobod Bode 2. You can see the base there remaining from the Z-axis of their gantry system printer. They then printed the layers, and after that, they disassembled the printer, and Printed Farms was out of here. The general contractor brought the rest of the subcontractors in, starting with the roof, as you can see here, to finish out the house. Now, they're not done yet. They just got the trusses and the roof in. They don't even have the shingles on yet, but you get a much better idea of what the house will look like now, and this time, my feet are gonna stay dry during this tour. I think it looks great in here. There's a few decisions they made that are fairly unique to this house. We're going to discuss details with the contractor, how he won the permits, what was different from other similar sized house projects in this region, and what he would change in the next project he pursues with this technology. They added this cinder block portion here in the back. It'll be interesting to see why they didn't just print it. I think it might have been a little bit outside the range of the printer. As you can see, over here, one of the other anchors, and if the other anchor was even with that one, there wouldn't be space for this cinder block piece that juts out. I'll show you around the entrance. We come inside, there's this big room that takes up pretty much half the square footage of the building, and then there's one, two, three bedrooms, a bathroom, uh, and then another master bathroom. So you have two bathrooms and three bedrooms in this house, and they opted not to smooth the walls out. They could have used that technology, but they chose to leave the concrete layers. We'll see if they plan on covering any of those with plaster or drywall maybe. These two rooms are fairly small, but this one has a closet, that one does not. As you first walk in, it's a big space. The ceilings are very tall, I wanna say nine feet. Hi, I'm Kendra Light. I'm James Light. And we own Precision Building and Renovating, as well as our new launch, Gulf Coast Additive Manufacturing and Design. Uh, we got into affordable housing and 3D printing and affordable housing about five years ago, research-wise. Uh, this project kicked off the ground about um, a year ago in the planning process, and we just completed it in July of this year. It'll be sold to a, a family as certified affordable housing here in the city of Tallahassee. One of our main goals for pursuing this line of construction was to provide an option for families for more resilient housing that was affordable and create wealth building assets for families that are working to achieve equitable um, access to housing. We started our company in 2007 as a new construction, renovation, uh, construction company for both residential and commercial projects. And since that time, we've done a myriad of all of those things. Uh, everything from commercial build outs to uh, complete renovations of homes and new construction. Kendra and James are on a mission to use their contractor experience to print this same model of house on multiple different 3D concrete printers in order to figure out which one suits the utility best. They'll be able to compare and contrast each solution and give an insight unlike any other we've seen before into how these printers compete against each other. You mentioned control joints, which is um, wasn't planned as control joints. This was planned as a column. This is a little, we call squiggles to separate to provide an open bay, and this is where we put the structural rebar. So it does double as a control joint, but a primary reason why we had those is for structure, and the engineers wanted every six feet. But I have noticed that they have, they have vertical cracks there, which is good because it prevents them from being out here. The printer was going at about one-third its speed that it could go. It was the human's uh, working with it that was slowing it down so and you can almost see like the progression of layers this was a day and then we had a rain out which we only got two layers then we had another day and you can see where we had better days and not so good days and these smoothed out lines are actually me or one of the guys um, taking a trial and smoothing it out because the over extrusion we had an issue with over extrusion uh, was sticking out so far 
that it was, you know, and there are a few that are sticking out further than the rest, and it really makes it to where when you stucco, it's going to be a lot of mud that you got to put on there. So we actually just scraped it off as we went. If, if we saw that it was too much, like up here we had a lot, this was a really wet layer. So it wasn't uh, anything to do with squishing or com compressing uh, after the, the fact. Uh, it was literally done. And uh, two layers up, we noticed it was sticking out. We just swiped it off. As the days went on, did you notice a preferred strategy? Uh, yes. Um, not to fight against Mother Nature. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we picked one of the worst times of the year, and it wasn't like we picked it, um, to, to print. Middle of the summer, unbelievably hot. The sun was drying out the layers almost instantly, uh, and then it would pour. So uh, the, the actual the rain, we, we, when it started pouring, we would stop, cover everything up with plastic, um, and usually that was our best layer. We didn't have any cracks the next day we peeled the plastic off because it was, you know, we had the water and it was sealed up. So it's a really ideal way of curing, but you can't always predict the rain. Um, That's actually these. Um where you see all of these little drizzle marks. This color. This is actually this whole section we were printing during a drizzle. And so um, as each layer printed, it would push the water out because it wasn't raining so hard that we needed to stop printing, but it was, you know, just kind of a light rain that day. And so that's, that's where you see all these little lines here. Um, that is the, the water that's being pushed out as the print layers bond with each other. Um, and then these are the air, when we filled the cells with air crete, that's, that's what you see um, as the, like here and here, that's not print material, that is the um, like, like insulative air crete material that we use between the walls. Will there be a finish on any of these walls? Yes. So we'll be finishing the interior with uh, smooth plaster, the exterior with stucco. Um, in the future, we know that the technology is already there to be able to smooth as we go um, with both Cobod and, uh, and other print systems as well. So we're excited about that, but for this print, we'll be, we'll be smoothing. And while we're here, the outlets, is there anything you would change about how you did that? Well, yes. This was a result of the building inspectors. During permitting, they didn't fully understand what this was going to be. So as we were doing it and having it inspected, uh, they required us to change our method just a little bit. So we were going to cut out the mud as it was wet, like we did, but we were going to stick the outlet box in there. Uh, but they changed it on us and said, no, we want to have the box connected to the conduit um, all in one go and, and us inspect that. So we had to come back and actually cut out um, and that's why we have this foam because we had to overcut the the, uh, the hole so we can right. put the, the plastic box in there so that I think is a, a little bit of a misunderstanding with the building inspectors it didn't um, make for as much of a clean look as we wanted yeah so you know when you cut out concrete you always when you, when you leave an opening you always leave a little bigger opening because it's impossible to shave off a little bit of concrete so we had to make a little bit bigger and then come back after the fact and foam them in. You can see the print layer where the where the print and the little the little teeth on the printer that made the little uh, scrapes uh, to make a nice mechanical connection between the layers. But then also you see where we filled in with air creep. This is a lightweight concrete, about uh, one third the weight of regular concrete. And that's what we use for insulation. So we, we like that method. All right, so these bays are filled with air crete, whereas our structural bays are filled with rebar and structural grade concrete. And that's what gives us the post and beam uh, engineering that we needed in order to uh, make this a permitted project. This is for electrical box, you can see. And you can see where we scraped them as the mud was wet, and then every once in a while we, we just missed it because there's too many things going on. Um, so this will have to be cut out. And then this is where we'll lay conduit. Um, on the surface of the wall as opposed to in the wall cavity. Right, and that's because some of the interior walls are Perfect. um are, are There's back no to void. back. There's no void. So that's why we did that. And you can there. see also on these, this is a wet layer here. You see it uh, you see how it's almost dripped a little bit. That was just a little bit too wet. So we had to fight with the elements and then um, you know just the logistics of having hose and the pump and the mix. There was little rocks in the mix. Um, 
or in the, in the dry, and so it would go through and it would get stuck, and then it would have more water and not as much dry. Um, and then other times we had too much dry, not enough water. Right. So it was that kind of a struggle in the mixing and the pumping. That was a great learning experience for us in figuring out what we can do to make it better the next time. So, you know, we go home at the end of every day and come up with, you know, every challenge that we had and, and list a solution for that. Um, and then, of course, collaborate with whomever in the industry we're working with. So whether it be the concrete mix or the uh, machine itself so that we can continue to make this process better. We knew that we wanted a three bedroom, two bath that had as much open living space as possible. So this is going to be, here is the living area for the space, kitchen, island. This is the laundry area, which will be open to the living space. We're doing an all in one washer dryer unit uh, to save space, but it'll also sit underneath the countertop with overhead cabinets so that it blends nicely into the design of the home. Um, we are doing a laminate uh, wood flooring in here that is waterproof, and we will not be doing any trim. When we do our plaster work, we'll be wrapping all of that directly into the framing for our doors and windows, as well as into the sheetrock for the ceiling so that we get a really nice, smooth, ergonomic design in here. In the future, we would like to do an insel deck roof system when we design these homes. However, for the architectural standards of the neighborhood, we wanted to keep with the historic nature of this neighborhood that we're in. So we went ahead and did a, uh, a truss and shingle roof. Uh, we did a hip design in order to make it as storm resilient as possible. And we will be doing a 30 year architectural shingle um, with blown insulation up here to give us as much energy efficiency as possible. A flex space that we designed into the front, so a lot of people are working from home these days, and we wanted to provide a space in the home that can be used as a home office, a dining area, or a play space for children, whatever it is that the family needs most. So that's this space when you first walk in the front, it's just a flex space to be able to use for whatever you'd like. Um, in the front of the home, we have this little alcove here um, that opens up into two bedrooms. So you have two nice sized bedrooms, each with a window and closet. And then this space was designed uh, for the purposes of this build. It will be used as the home's pantry space, uh, but the sizing and the openings are designed that if the family wanted to add in a gas fireplace later, they could. Um, or uh, they can use it for storage, which is what we decided to do here with this one. This is a mechanical closet for all of your HVAC system. And then through this hallway is the home's uh, family bathroom, or the bathroom that's open to the rest of the house. Both bathrooms for the house and all of the water comes down one central water line, so um, the, the bathroom for the owner suite and the two bedrooms back up to each other, as well as our laundry area and our um, sink and dishwasher for the kitchen all on one single line. So this is the owner suite. There'll be a full glass uh, door here that goes out onto our patio in the back, closet and entrance into the owner's bathroom. We originally designed this house for a different type of printer uh, and it didn't work out. So we went with the Kobod printer and the Kobod printer of course needs the feet and the shape of the house was bigger than the footprint of the printer. Um, so we have three feet, but this little kick out here, which was outside of the print area, we ended up um, just anchoring the foot right to the slab. And that's where you see these bolts. We'll just come back and cut those off. That's probably the way I would design and use a Kobod system in the future, have some kind of a patio or something, um, epoxy the bolts down, and then just cut them off afterwards instead of trying to lug the feet around or make the feet because those things are really problematic. Right, right. Uh, and that's why we did this out of cinder block because it was outside the print area. So because of our setbacks on this property, we were not able to build a carport or a garage for this home. So instead we designed this outdoor storage area off of a patio. So in the future, this will be a poured concrete patio with two glass doors, one going from the main living space, one going from the owner suite out to the patio. And they'll be able to use this as closed lockable storage. Something in particular that inspired you to 3D print homes or? It started with Houston flooding about five years ago. Um, we've been builders since 2007. So um, we've been in this industry for a long time and James does a lot of remodeling as well, so seeing everything that breaks down as far right, as wood. Right, um, and it's just, uh, you know, this is a better method. It's more efficient, uh, better material quality. Um, 
you know, I fixed a lot of stuff, so I can tell you everything that's going to fail and when it's going to fail. And I just uh, really got tired and, and uh, irritated of, of fixing the same thing over and over again. You know, the definition of insane is... We're dinosaurs. I mean, we're trying, trying to apply the same methods to fix a problem and, and wonder why it didn't work. You know, and so I, I looked at it and thought, okay, you know what? The industry's not doing anything about this. We've got a handful of people trying to do 3D printing, some new method of construction. So I, it's, it's the future. I saw it, and I, I just got involved and been chugging along ever since trying to trying to get it permitted so it's a lot more accepted now even, right even two and a half years ago when we first tried to apply for a permit it was still an unknown and they were very hesitant uh, different building department how did you manage to get permits to build this a lot of communication a slow introduction boiling it down in simple terms because it's really not that complicated it's really just a precise concrete pump everything's the same it's still concrete it's still being applied. It's layers, just like block. Block is in layers. I think if you, you know, teach them, then they can say, oh, you know, it's just not that crazy. They're more open to, you know, understand how to approve it as opposed to just kind of brushing it off saying, we don't want to deal with this. We don't have the time, uh, which is kind of the issue that we had originally was the building department just didn't have the time. I mean, maybe they didn't have the resources. I get it, but I'd recommend start introducing, talking to the building departments. Um, and showing them information, showing them stuff, different methods. Our engineer um, and architect and us, um, we all pulled together to put together plans that were easily digestible for the building department. But then also, before we ever even submitted for permitting, we connected with leadership within the building department to sit down and have a meeting and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Um, here are our goals and our vision for this project and here's where we see this going and really to create that collaborative relationship so that you know we're not asking anybody to cut corners but we're also asking that if you see an issue not to shut the project down but hey come to us and say you know we have questions about this the way that you're applying this method or that method and could you please be more clear in how you're um, explaining throughout the permit process and so really developing that communication um, one of the key components to this house is the engineering method. I mean, it's post and beam. It's something that is very well known, very easy to apply. Anyone who wants to print a house, the onus is on them to prove their case to the building department. The printed wall is really like a, a form that stays in place. It's kind of also treated as a facade, like a brick facade. Really overkill, the actual printed walls themselves do have a lot of structural value, but we're not giving it the structural value that, that it could. Um, we're relying on the concrete that we pour on the inside. Well, this being the first one, you know, we have to transport everything. Um, and luckily, it was within the same state in South Florida. So it wasn't too crazy. But if you're going, you know, a thousand miles uh, from across the country, I don't know how you could possibly have any type of uh, hope for having any profit right. or even breaking even, really. You're really going to be underwater. But um, for the most part, this, you have fixed costs. You have, we had to ship the material from uh, Dallas. So obviously that's not efficient. Um, now they're opening up a closer plant here, and so that'll, that'll help. Um, so the industry is still got to catch up with the infrastructure right. to be able to um, supply, but uh, the first one's definitely going to cost more money. Uh, just, you know, all kinds of inefficiencies, and we had to rent the equipment for longer just because we weren't quite ready. We had, um, you know, kind of problems setting up and, and uh, little nuanced things that always take time, and if you got to delay, and you got six guys standing around, <laughs> you know, it's very expensive. So all that kind of a stuff that would be worked out if you did, you know. The, the, the second one, even, we would probably right. eliminate 25%. Um, right. I think by four or five houses printed, we would be, you know, you know, they're, they're, the problems are easy to correct. It's really logistics of the equipment. Um, the, equipment the printer yeah. itself, once, it, once you get it going, the, the BOD2 printer just motors along and it, you know, it's, it's only going to be slowed down by the, the humans that are operating it, um, getting the material fed properly. Um, the pump not, um, you know, if the pump has an issue or if there's a, a clump of material in there that gets caught, um, it does need to be cleaned uh, every so often so that um, kind of when you're NASCAR and the, they come in for a pit stop and they swap the tires out, same kind of a thing with the pump. We have to slow it down and then he has to clean it so it's a kind of on the clock hurrying up and, and swapping and cleaning the um, 
the which nozzle. I have to say, I mean, the collaborative energy with Printed Farms was incredible, and I know that they put forth a significant investment of their own to make this project happen, right. and their team was incredible. Um, and so, you know, even with all of the challenges that we had, we still got this print done in nine days uh, and 25 hours of print time, which is, is still, you know, we were very proud of that. I think the most exciting part is once this method gets to scale and we have the workforce and we have the machines that we need in order to build the houses that we need, um, the prices on this building method will come down. Um, all of our projections show that we'll be at 25% less than stick built construction once we reach full scale. And that's really exciting for families. Uh, that's the same price as a mobile home, but you have a strong, resilient wealth building asset for working class families to be able to afford a home. And that is our vision, that is our goal, and why we're doing what we're doing. I also see a lot of these other projects around uh, you know, Arizona, Virginia, where they just have hordes of people. You know, It's like, that's great. Everybody wants to be involved, I, I get it. But you're, we're not doing the industry any good if we have 12 guys out there um, you know, operating the printer when it could be framed up with four guys uh, in traditional methods. So you're not really doing any justice. So I really wanted to have as small a crew as possible to make everything uh, function. And I feel like we did, considering um, we had to move the super sacks of material from the street with a loader up on top of the silo and then have a person up there dumping the material in the silo. Um, so that alone would be, uh, you know, we're gonna change that for the next time around, just with a different silo and, and, uh, right. and the loader and access the materials. And that was another, that's a logistical thing with the, with the property, it's only 50 feet wide. Right. So we the had just enough space right. to drive by it. It was the supportive equipment for the printer, not the printer itself, um, that we are working on building out and and trying to collaborate with um, with the industry and in making sure that the silo, the pump, um, and all of the supportive equipment needed to make the printer operate to its fullest potential right. um, are there. And I think that those are the logistics that we learned a lot about during this project. And um, there's an opportunity to save money even further as we move forward. As you continue to pursue 3D print construction projects, will your next project use a Cobalt printer or are you looking for other printers? We're looking to collaborate with all other print companies. Right. Uh, I've reached out to everybody, uh, I think, that's that has an option or has put themselves out there as an option um, and, and given them the opportunity to collaborate. Um, as a general contractor, I can build anything in Florida and uh, having the printed, uh, this permitted um, print house here is, is uh, kind of, people understand, okay, he can do it. We'll buy our own printer, we'll have our own um, projects going and I'm also open to working with with everybody. The goal and the startup of Gulf Coast Additive Manufacturing and Design, um, our initial research plan was to build the same house use, utilizing different printers. Um, so our next project will be the same exact design but we're that. going to utilize a different printer and then we can um, not compare. just cost analysis compare but also like you're saying logistics and equipment and seeing and it's not that one printer is necessarily better than another printer um, it's just the application of what types of projects so it, after our research process is done we might say well for a small building in a tight space this type of printer may be best or for a large commercial space storage buildings are really being looked into heavily right now um, or even coastal design construction where you're printing 18 feet in the air, other types of printers might be the best application. And so we're really trying to research and develop a authenticated means process for analyzing which printers are gonna be best for which types of projects. The air we put in is, is consistency of like water, very thin. So it would find any little crack in the print layers. And you can see like right here, tiny little crack and there it is, it, it, it'll, it'll tell you. Um, we had obviously this layer here had had some uh, bonding issues here a little bit. I mean, this is super thin stuff that it's it's like water. So it's got to I mean, to be watertight is pretty hard to do. Pointing out these little things, but really my my main intent here is to point out the fact that the vast majority of the wall, the printed wall, is watertight uh, from the inside. For the most part, the entire wall is, is practically watertight, which is pretty amazing. There was a process that Latta Creek gave us for shutting down the job site every day, and it included, you know, spraying it down and and then covering it with a burlap and and all these things. And you know, because of the weather, we ended up getting dumped on, and it was just a pouring rain, and we ended up covering it with plastic because we didn't want the rain to pour on the wet concrete. 
and we came back the next day and it was this gorgeous yeah really the, <laughs> and the, so we kind of were learning humidity. as we go it was yeah. the humidity and, and the so rain everything was the air is wet this right. is the south you yeah. know? yeah it's always tarpet after well, yeah, we it ended it up rain, right? yeah so in the summertime well, no, at the here end in florida of the day, we would cover it right summertime here in florida it rains every day at four o'clock i mean you can almost set your okay. watch by it and so every day four o'clock we'd pretty much you know get the downpour and we would print all the way up until we could not print any longer and then cover it with plastic i also work in community development here and so um you know i i would work with uh, the homeless population and affordable housing and we would see situations where families were placed in rentals that were dilapidated and run down the ac systems were covered in mold and the effects of that on our community as a whole when you know you've got a single mother who's working three jobs and she has to take time off work because her child has asthma and is going to the doctor again because they're sick because of mold and um, the the wood rot that's all through the house and causing energy inefficiencies. So those utility bills wind up um, with the renters and it was just the snowball effect of, of community hardship that um, then you add in natural disasters like flooding in Houston and then the hurricanes that we were experiencing Hurricane here and Michael. we just, right, Hurricane Michael. Um, and it just, it, it got to the breaking point where we were like, something has to give. Our community here in Leon County is 40,000 units short when it comes to affordable housing. Um, we can't cinder block all those buildings. We don't have the labor force. Uh, James came to me with it five years ago and I was like, you're crazy, this is insane. Um, and he's like, well, let's just, let's just do some research and let's travel around and talk to some people. And so we did, we started, we, you know, we talked with Branch Technologies in Chattanooga, and then we flew to Utah and talked with Mudbots and um, flew down and, you know, talked with Printed Farms. And the research mission in the founding of this company is to print the same design house utilizing different 3D printers in order to develop a knowledge base on which printers are best for which types of projects. And so that is, that is, this is the first project of that research phase, and we'll be breaking ground on the next project early in the new year. We started, we had the, we had the plan and we had the dimensions set for the doors and windows. Um, but being the first one, we didn't fully under, you know, understand how the printer was going to react and the ink and everything else. Uh, so what we had was an over extrusion of the ink layers uh, more than we wanted. And so when that happened, we didn't account for enough for the rough opening for the door. This, this from here to here is too small for the door. So as we're going up, we realized that about, you know, here, and then we tried to start scraping it down thinking, okay, well, we can scrape it, but it gets hard so quick and it's hard to, to scrape. Uh, and so this was a daybreak and we went back, reprogrammed um, the design so that, it, that this was wider even more. And then from here up, we, we have the correct opening, rough opening for the door. So this, we're gonna have to cut with a saw, unfortunately, and it's gonna be a bear. Um, but this is, uh, you know, it's another experience. It's a, it's, it's, it's a problem, but we were able to correct it. You know, you need to account for your extrusion plus rough openings for sizes for doors and windows. So on this house, we'll be able to cut for our door openings what we need, and then we had to custom order sizing for the windows based right. on what the windows ended up being when we were finished, Versus which is a we added cost, <laughs> right? However, again, we can plan for it in the future because we had originally designed the home with all standard sizing windows that just comes off the shelf. Uh, front section, about three feet, was actually outside the print area as well. Um, our printer was uh, 47 and this is 40, 49 ish. And it was, uh, so basically we, we, we took the three foot outer wall section and we put it inside the print area inside the room and printed it as all part of the, the initial print and then we picked it up and we set it in place and when we did that of course we had a, a joint here formed it up and poured it full so when we take these off it'll just be a control joint or like a um, um, butt joint so here at Gulf Coast Additive Manufacturing and Design, we are looking for collaborators throughout the country in industrial sciences um, and equipment, and as well as uh, interns who are interested in 3D printing and construction. And we're also looking for collaborators in the development of affordable communities for, um, for families and veterans and all kinds of different applications. Really, to make it economically viable, we, we need to have a project, I would say 10 houses 
So if you have a development of 10 or more houses, that would make sense, um, depending upon the size and location logistics. Um, but really the one-off houses, and I've, I've had a lot of interest in that, and it's fantastic, and I'm, I'm happy to have the interest, and I encourage them to stay in touch. Uh, but I just you know, tell them that we, we can't, um, it's not economically viable right now to go and do one house. It's just, we'll get there. It's, it's a lot of fixed costs up front. Um, and uh, before we, unless we have more training uh, done, we will do all this stuff ourselves. <laughs> so we need to train some duplicates yeah. and uh, to be able to do the work and, and uh, so we can focus on the bigger picture things. We need a workforce and more printers. Yes. Contact info. Uh, you can contact us at www.rethinkconstruction.com. Yeah, you can email there. I think phone numbers are on there. All of our contact the, the best, information best is on our website. Best ways to email. Yeah. Yes. Best ways email. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool.